Hello everyone and welcome to The Good Old Gamer. So Intel threw off all of my game plans by getting me the 13th gen CPUs a little bit earlier than I was anticipating. So yesterday morning they came in and I was like, all right, let's start with the 13600K. This seems to be one many of you guys are interested in. A lot of the tech press out there seems to be pretty interested in it. And there was a few caveats here with it running hot and loud and all the rest of this. So I was like, hmm, let's go ahead and start with this guy as it's probably gonna be the CPU I will recommend. And I'm going to use an air cooler and I'm gonna go ahead and see how far we can push it. And guys, I was able to get mine on air running at 5.7 gigahertz, all core, and it runs just fine. It will hit TJ Maxx under synthetic fake workloads, but under any sort of real world condition, temperatures are just fine. So today we're gonna go ahead and take a look at the hardware. We're gonna take a look inside the BIOS a little bit, show you guys what I did, how I did things to keep this chip under control. And then I'm gonna go ahead and show you guys some preliminary benchmarks. I don't have access to my buddy's 4090 yet. I only have a 3060 Ti on hand, but we're gonna be running things like RPCS3, which are completely CPU bound. And using that, I will show you guys some preliminary numbers. So alrighty guys, let's go ahead and jump right on into it. So as mentioned, I'm using the Core i5-13600K that Intel sent on over, and this normally will go all the way up to 5.1 gigahertz on its own. Uh, yeah, so we can get a lot more out of it, obviously. And then I'm pairing this with the ASRock Z690 Steel Legend motherboard, which honestly, I really like the looks of these motherboards. I'm not really an RGB guy, but these are also very affordable when they go on sale. Here in the US, these went on sale twice in the past couple of weeks for $140. This is a DDR4 board, so I went ahead and paired it with the Patriot Viper Steel Series DDR4. These are the 4400 kit, as good friend Ivan over on Frame Chasers went ahead and saw a 4266 running on his 13600K. I wanted to see if that was possible. Uh, I was not able to achieve that, but I will go ahead and go over the specs that I was able to get here in just a sec. Alrighty guys, so now that we're in the BIOS here, you can see we got the Steel Legend. You do have to update the BIOS. Um, they came out with one at the end of September. So make sure that you have the latest BIOS to go ahead and support the 13th gen CPUs. I know MSI has been supporting 13th gen for a while now, and I tried installing the CPU. I'm like, yeah, no, these guys have all updated. No, you, you need to have the latest one. Just trust me on that one. All right, so anyways, you can see here, we got the Patriot Viper running at DDR4 4000. So moving on over, um, first off, this is what the BIOS looks like on the ASRock. Uh, motherboard. I actually kind of like it now that I'm getting used to it. It's pretty straightforward when you go to the OC tweaker. You have CPU stuff, RAM stuff, voltage stuff, and Fiverr is just more voltage stuff. So real quick, let's start with that. I'm going to show you guys around the, the motherboard a little bit. As you guys voted on Techonomics on Friday, which by the way, if you haven't subscribed, links are down below, that you want to see how these BIOSes operate. So first things first, that took me a while to figure out. You go onto the Fiverr configuration, and this is where your system age and voltage is. So on mine, I just set it to 1.25. This is what I run my 12600K at. Basically, I just mimicked my exact same settings that I do on the 12600K to see what would happen. And yeah, we get a lot more speed out of the 13th gen. So anyways, this is where you set that in this BIOS. I don't really mess with any of the rest of these in here. Under voltage, uh, this actually runs under volted, meaning at 1.52, it's running at 1.5 volts. You have to verify inside of Windows. Every motherboard's a little quirky like that. Load line calibration at one. Now the fixed voltage on the CPU core, I have at 1.28 volts. On my 12600K, I run at 1.27. To make 5.7 gigahertz stable, I had to go up that 10 extra millivolts. So not a big difference there, but that's where we're running that. And then we have our IMC, they call it the VDD IMC. This is actually your VDDQ voltage. So they just changed the name on there. That took me a little bit to figure out as well. So if you're using an ASRock board, they're actually talking about the VDDQ. I'm running that at also 1.25 volts. Under the CPU configuration, as you can see here, we're running all core at 57, which is 5.7 gigahertz with a 100 megahertz um, B clock, and then the cache ratio, this is your ring clock, and this is running at 5.4 gigahertz. So that's where all of that is. Under advanced, go under CPU settings. This is where we disable our E cores. I do not run E cores because this is meant for gaming. 
So to me, this is really just a six core 12 thread CPU. It's a very fast six core 12 thread CPU, but still, uh, if you want to use E-Cores, you can go ahead and do so. Your ring clock will not go as high. And honestly, it's not gonna make any real difference in gaming if you're using Windows 11, but I also only run Windows 10. So E-Cores are a no-go for me. And the last helpful thing in the BIOS that you might wanna know is under advanced, go ahead and change your UEFI setup to advanced. I hate when these things just boot into that easy mode thing and you always have to hit the button. I get it, it's only like one extra click, but it's just much easier when you just set to advanced mode. Um, most companies like to try to hide this, so that's why I wanted to point that out because I always do that as well. All right, so the last thing to really check out in here that I messed with is DRAM configuration. So going under here, we I set the XMP profile, which is the DDR4-4400. Obviously, that's not going to work. We set to DDR4-4000, gear one. Now, the final thing that I do with the AK620 cooler, since I like to run it in a single fan configuration, is I go under hardware monitor and I run mine at full speed. Now, the microphone that I'm using right now is literally two feet away from the fan running at full speed and you guys probably can't hear it. It's actually very, very quiet. That's why I don't mind running it at full speed at all times. Now, this helps when you're doing stress tests because it takes the load from, well, idle effectively, all the way to 100% max load, and modern CPUs with how dense they are don't like that, so they need to stay cool while stress testing it. Now, when you're just using the PC like normal, full speed may not be necessary, but in my opinion, it's quiet enough that I just don't care. That's subjective, but either way, it'll work. This just seems to less stress out the CPU from those huge massive heat spikes initially, in my opinion, because it takes a second for the fan to start spinning up. So while we're here capturing footage, might as well run a quick latency test, show you guys where our memory is at on this particular system. All right, so as you can see, we're getting about 62 gigabytes per second transfer speed, anywhere between 43 and 45 nanoseconds, depending on run-to-run -run variants. That's normal, that's the exact same thing that I get on my i5-12600K. Since the RAM's literally running with all the same specs, well, that makes sense. Now, before we get into gaming, the last thing that I wanted to show you was how the CPU handles even CPU stress tests. So I loaded up OCCT here. We're using the AVX2 stress test, and we're gonna go ahead and run this, and I'm gonna show you how efficient this architecture can be when you go ahead and manually tune it and don't just let Intel's um, system automatically push things to the moon. All right, we just give it a second. So as it's kicking in, you can see the heat starting to spike up. Like I said, if you're not running that fan speed at 100, it'll spike up higher and then pull back down as the speed, uh, the fan speed ramps up. I just don't like that initial spike being that hard. So that's why I just run it at 100%, especially when stress testing. But even in my own main system, I run mine at 100 because it's quiet enough. But anyways, as you can see here, we're running around, what, 70C, somewhere in there. Now, this is obviously a synthetic stress test. In reality, running something like Handbrake, I found stressed out the CPU very similarly in terms of heat output. So if you go ahead and run that type of workload as your maximum CPU stress test, which for me, Handbrake is probably the max that I put on my CPU, it's gonna be very similar to this. Now, if I go ahead and use Y Cruncher over here, yeah, it's gonna go all the way to TJ Maxx because that thing literally uses every ounce of performance in your system. So if you wanna run like complete synthetics that just no real software is going to use or very few real softwares are actually gonna utilize, sure, yeah, you're gonna hit that 90 something degrees. But on air for regular usage, 75C under synthetic load, that's pretty good. All right, guys, I literally just turned off the system. And as you can see here, this is the AK620. I got the single fan in there. It does come with another fan. Um, but like I said, I like to my, run mine at 100. So when this fan dies, because they'll all die eventually, I already have a spare. It comes with a spare. And as you saw, it keeps everything really, really cool. I am using the RTX 3060 Ti because I did not borrow my buddy's GPU just yet, I just didn't have time to get around to it. And then uh, this is what we're gonna be using. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you, like I said, a couple of different benchmarks, mostly just to see how the CPU copes and uh, how the cooling handles it at 5.7 gigahertz. But as you saw, everything is running really good so far.
So the first thing I want to throw up is RPCS3. This is 100% CPU bound, and RTX 3060 Ti at 1080p is not going to bottleneck this game. So anyways, I wanted to compare this directly to the 12600K, as this is one of the more demanding CPU tests that I run. So we got the i5-13600K coming in with 126 FPS on average and 75 on the 1% low versus 124 FPS on average and 70 on that 1% low. Doesn't sound like a lot, but that extra 5 FPS, that comes out to being about a 7% increase considering this has a 9.5% clock speed advantage. So 9.5% extra clocks, 7% real world performance in this game. That sounds about right. So that's really good to see. The next one I was interested in testing was Spider-Man with ray tracing because this seems to be CPU bound even with, you know, lower end GPUs because, well, it's Spider-Man with ray tracing. However, once you get to Alder Lake and you tune your systems, that is no longer the case. So the Core i5-12600K at 5.2 gigahertz came in with 123 FPS and 90 on the low. And that's in comparison to the i5-13600K, which is showing 128 FPS on average and 91 on the 1% low. So this is just margin of error here. So we are definitely GPU bound in this test. That's at 1080p. So need a faster GPU to even test Spider-Man at 1080p. The next game I wanted to test is Elden Ring because this is very single thread heavy. It's basically just using one core and the results here are kind of interesting. I got the 12600K coming in at 124 FPS average, 98 on the 1% low. And then we have the 13600K coming in at 117 FPS on average and then 96 on the 1% low. So once again, just virtually tied here, it's just margin of error stuff. And what that means is these CPUs are so powerful that yeah, even though this is single threaded, they're still GPU bound with this graphics card. And what this demonstrates is both Alder Lake and Raptor Lake are so powerful that the 3060 Ti, even at 1080p, just isn't enough grunt to push these guys. They are maxing out this GPU, even though this is typically run as a CPU test or single thread CPU test. It's pretty insane here how fast these CPUs are now getting. And then the last one I want to take a quick look at is Shadow of the Tomb Raider. We have the 12600K at 5.2 coming in at 138 FPS on average, 112 on the 1% low. The 13600K does see a little bit of an advantage here coming in at 140 FPS on average. That's margin of error, but 119 on that 1% low, slightly higher. Once again, we are still pretty much within margin of error territory. Alrighty guys, this is just a preliminary look. Obviously I need to get a faster graphics card to really see where these guys stack up next to each other. But if you think about it, I mean a 13600K paired with something like a 3060 Ti or an RTX or an RX 6700 XT, that seems pretty normal, wouldn't you guys say? I mean, that's kind of the range of graphics card most people would be looking at. Uh, now, these are $300 CPUs. Those are about $300 graphics cards. So it's not outside the realm of possibility that somebody with this level of CPU will be buying this. So the initial impressions of R Raptor Lake is actually pretty good. It's basically just Alder Lake. It'll just clock higher. So... That, that's a good thing. I mean, it, it's not going to get you world shattering, earth shattering performance differences. As we saw our PCS3, that is 100% CPU bound. And in that one, we got 7% faster. That sounds about right, considering there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of extra IPC in here. Now, the 13600K does have a little bit more L3 cache because it has more E cores that may come in handy at some point, but in reality, from what we're seeing, not gonna be a huge difference between these, even with a faster graphics card. So what this really says to me is more than likely, I'm not gonna give my definitive opinion until I do more testing, but it seems like if you can get a 12600K for between 200 and $230, I have seen them for 220, I've put them out uh, as posts for you guys to pick up when I saw them at 220, I think at that price point in comparison to $300 to $330 for the 13600K, that's just gonna be the better way to go. You're gonna get most of the performance, especially if you're not going to be using the e-cores. Now, if you need the e-cores, that's gonna add more value to the 13600K. Overall, I would say if the 12600Ks are over $230, you might as well spend the extra 50, 60 bucks and get the faster CPU. Not gonna lie, it's really interesting to see the basically the same silicon just at the same voltages go from 5.2 gigahertz all the way to 5.7. So there's definitely 
some refinements in there to allow them for that. This isn't just simple binning. There is no possible way for them to get that clock speed at those voltages with Alder Lake. So there, there's definitely a few things that Intel did to make this better. It doesn't run all that hot. As you guys saw during the gaming benchmarks, runs normal, right? You would expect the, that level of heat on an air cooler, right? So in my opinion, everything's pretty much just fine with this. It's Alder Lake, but faster. So far, that is my impressions. I'll give you guys more information once I go ahead and get more testing done. And then uh, here in the not too distant future, I will also be doing a giant suite of games and CPUs using a mid-range graphics card like the 3060 Ti. So you guys can find where that limit is, like where does it stop scaling? And in reality, I've actually found some pretty interesting numbers in there. So you don't wanna miss that. So make sure you subscribe to the channel. If you wanna pick up any of the stuff that I was talking about here today, affiliate links are down below that does help support the channel and helps me get this stuff on hand. So if you guys do wanna go ahead and buy any of that, links are down below, go for it. I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, that's really all I have for you guys here today in this little quick look, fast action video that I'm doing off the cuff, no planning. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed it and I will catch you guys in the next video.